Chapter 10 Nitya Dharma and History Sri Harihara Bhattacharya was a professor residing in Agradvip. He had accepted initiation into Vaishnava Dharma and was engaged in the worship of Bhagavan Sri Krishna in his home. But a doubt arose in his mind about Vaishnavism, which he could not dispel, even after speaking to many people about it. In fact, such talk only agitated his mind further. One day, Harihara went to the village of Arkatila and inquired from Sri Chattabhuj Nayaratna, Bhattacharya Mahashai, can you tell me how long ago Vaishnava Dharma appeared? For nearly twenty years, Nayaratna Mahashai had laboriously studied the Nyaya Shastra. Consequently, he had become quite indifferent to religion, and he did not like to be bothered with religious discussions. He only displayed any devotional tendency when he was performing Shakti Puja, worshipping Goddess Durga. When Nyaya Ratna heard this question, he thought that Harihara, being partial to the Vaishnava religion, intended to embroil him in a dispute, and that it would be best to avoid such a conflict. Thinking like this, Nyaya Ratna Mahashai said, Harihara, what kind of question are you asking me today? You have studied the Nyaya Shastra all the way up to the Muktipad section. Look, you know that there is no mention of Vaishnava Dharma anywhere in the Nyaya Shastra. So why are you burdening me with such a strange question? Harihara, now slightly aggravated, replied, Bhattacharya Mahashai, my forefathers have been Vaishnavas for many generations. I am also initiated with a Vaishnava mantra, and I have never had any doubt about Vaishnava Dharma. However, you may have heard that Tarka Chudamani of Vikramapur intends to uproot the Vaishnava religion, and as a result he is preaching against it at the moment, both locally and abroad, and earning a good deal of wealth by doing so. In a meeting that was attended mostly by worshippers of Durga, he proclaimed that the Vaishnava religion is very recent and has no philosophical substance. He said that only low-class people become Vaishnavas. High-class people do not respect Vaishnava Dharma. When I first heard such conclusions from a scholar of his stature, it somewhat pained my heart. But when I thought it over, it occurred to me that no Vaishnava Dharma existed anywhere in Bengal prior to the appearance of Sri Chaitanya Dev. Before that, everyone worshipped Goddess Durga and recited the Shakti mantras. Granted, there were a few Vaishnavas like ourselves who worshipped by reciting Vaishnav mantras, but everyone's goal was ultimately to attain Brahman and Mukti, and to this end they diligently applied themselves. In the type of Vaishnava Dharma into which we were initiated, everyone approved of the Panchopashana system, but after Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's time, Vaishnava Dharma assumed a new outlook, and now Vaishnavas cannot even bear to hear the words Mukti and Brahman. I cannot even say what they think Bhakti is. Well, as they say, a one-eyed cow often strays from the herd. That applies perfectly to modern Vaishnavas. So my question is, did this type of Vaishnava Dharma exist previously, or has it only appeared since the time of Chaitanya Dev? Seeing that Harihara was not as orthodox a Vaishnava as he had feared, Nyayaratna Mahashai's face blossomed with happiness. Harihara, he said, you are a true scholar of the Nyaya Shastra. You have just expressed exactly what I believe. These days there is a new upsurge of Vaishnava Dharma, and I am afraid to say anything against it. We must be a little cautious, because it is the age of Kali. Many wealthy and respectable gentlemen have now accepted Chaitanya's doctrine. They completely disregard us and even think that we are their enemies. I am afraid that our profession will become obsolete within a short time. Why, even the inferior castes of oil sellers, betel leaf vendors and gold traders have taken to studying the Shastra, and that pains us. Look, for a long time the Brahmanas had arranged things so that no other caste could study the Shastra. Even the Kayashtas, 
who are just below the Brahmana caste. Everyone was forced to honor our words. Now people of all castes have become Vaishnavas and deliberate on philosophical truths, and this has greatly damaged the reputation of the Brahmana caste. Nimai Pandit is responsible for the destruction of Brahmana Dharma. Harihara, it may be that Tarika Chudamani is acting out of greed for wealth or through political motivation, but either way he has spoken correctly. When I hear the words of the Vaishnavas, my body burns with anger. Now they go as far as to say that Sankaracharya established Mayavad Shastra on the order of Bhagavan himself and that the Vaishnava religion is eternal. The religion that sprung up not even a hundred years ago has now become eternal. How amazing! It is said, the benefit which is meant for one man is enjoyed by another. Whatever glory Navadweep attained formerly has now been laid to waste. In particular, there are some Vaishnavas who now live at Gadigacha in Navadweep who look upon the world as a shallow earthen plate. A few good scholars among them have stirred up such a great commotion that it has ruined the entire country. Now the occupational duties of the four castes, the eternal truth of the doctrine of Mayavad, and the worship of the Devatas and Devis are all fading into oblivion. People seldom perform the Shraddha ceremony for the benefit of their deceased relatives anymore. How are we Brahmanas to survive? Harihara said, Mahatma, is there no remedy for this? In Mayapur, there are still six or seven Brahman scholars of great repute. Across the Ganga, in Kulyagram, there are also numerous scholars who are well versed in the Shmriti and Naya Shastra. If they all combine together and attack Gadigacha, will it not bear fruit? Nyaya Ratna said, Why not? It's possible if the Brahmana Pandits can unite but there are differences among them these days. I heard that a few pundits, headed by Krishna Chudamani, went to Gadigacha and initiated a debate, but they came back to their schools hopelessly defeated by the Vaishnava's superior scholarship and knowledge. Harihara said, Bhattacharya Mahashai, you are not only our teacher, but the teacher of many teachers. Your commentary on the Nyaya Shastra has taught many scholars the art of reasoning by analyzing fallacious arguments. If you so desire, you can defeat these Vaishnava scholars once and for all. Establish that the Vaishnava religion is a modern invention that the Vedas do not support. This will be a great act of mercy on the Brahmanas, and it will reinstate our long-established Panchopashana worship, which is on the point of vanishing. Chatubhuj Nayaratna was inwardly afraid to debate with the Vaishnavas, thinking that they might defeat him as they had Krishna Chudamani and others. He said, Harihara, I will go in disguise. You should pose yourself as a teacher and ignite the fire of debate at Gadigacha. After that I will take over and assume responsibility. Harihara said happily, I will certainly carry out your order. Next Monday we will cross the Ganga and attack them invoking the name of Mahadev for auspiciousness. Monday arrived while they were still pondering over this matter. Three professors, Harihara, Kamalakanta and Sadashiva, met Sri Chaturbhuj Nayaratna at his home in Arkatila and escorted him across the Ganga to Godrum. They arrived at the Madhavi Grove exclaiming, Haribol, Haribol, looking somewhat reminiscent of Durvasa Muni surrounded by his followers. Sri Advaita Das came to greet them and offer them each a sitting mat. He then inquired with affection, How may I be of service to you? Harihara said, We have come to discuss some matters with the Vaishnavas. Advaita said, The Vaishnavas of this place do not debate on any topic. However, it is all right if you have come to inquire submissively about something. The other day a few professors initiated a full-scale debate on the pretext of making some inquiries, and in the end they left greatly disturbed. I will ask Paramahamsa Babaji Mahashai and then give you an answer. Saying this, he entered Babaji Mahashai's kutia. A few moments later, 
Our waiter Das returned and arranged more mats for sitting. Then Paramahamsa Babaji Mahashai came into the grove and offered Dandavat Pranam to Vrindadevi and then to the cultured Brahmana visitors. With folded hands he inquired humbly, O great souls, please order us, what service can we do for you? Nyaya Ratna said, We have one or two questions to ask and we would like you to answer them. When Paramahamsa Babaji Mahashai heard this request, he summoned Sri Vaishnav Das Babaji Mahashai to join them. When Vaishnav Das Babaji arrived, he offered pranam to Paramahamsa Babaji and sat next to him. Within a short while, a small group of Vaishnavas had gathered. Nyayaratna Mahashai then asked his question, Please tell us whether the Vaishnava religion is ancient or modern. Paramahamsa Babaji Mahashai requested Vaishnav Das to respond. In a peaceful yet grave tone of voice, Vaishnav Das said, The Vaishnava Dharma is Sanatan, everlasting, and Nitya, eternal. Nyaya Ratna, I see that there are two types of Vaishnava Dharma. One maintains that the Paratattva, known as Brahman, is formless and devoid of qualities. However, since there is no question of worshipping a formless object, Sadakas first imagine Brahman to have some form, and then they worship that. This worship is only needed to purify the heart, and when the heart is purified, knowledge of the formless Brahman arises. At that point, there is no longer any need to continue the worship of forms. The forms of Radha, Krishna, Ram or Nishringa are all imaginary and are by-products of Maya. When one worships these imaginary forms, knowledge of Brahman gradually awakens. Among worshippers of the five deities, Panchopasakas, those who worship the deity of Vishnu and recite Vishnu mantras with this attitude consider themselves Vaishnavas. In the second type of Vaishnava Dharma, Bhagavan Vishnu, Ram or Krishna are accepted as Parabrahma, possessing eternal forms. When the sadhak worships one of these particular forms with the corresponding mantras, he obtains eternal knowledge of the specific deity whom he worships and receives the mercy of that deity. According to this view, the doctrine of impersonalism is Mayavad, which is a misconception that Sankara has propagated. Now tell us, which of these two types of Vaishnavism is everlasting and eternal? Vaishnav Das The second of these is the real Vaishnava Dharma, and it is eternal. The other is Vaishnava Dharma in name only. In reality, this pseudo Vaishnava Dharma is opposed to real Vaishnava Dharma. It is temporary and has originated from Mayavad doctrine. Nyaya Ratna I understand that in your opinion, the only true Vaishnava Dharma is the doctrine that you have received from Chaitanya Dev. You do not accept that the worship of Radha Krishna, Ram or Nishringa constitutes Vaishnava Dharma in and of itself. You only accept the worship of Radha Krishna or other deities as Vaishnava Dharma if it is conducted in accordance with the ideology of Chaitanya. Is this not so? It is a fine idea, but how can you claim that this type of Vaishnava Dharma is eternal? Vaishnava Das This type of Vaishnava Dharma is taught throughout the Vedic Shastras and is instructed in all the Smriti Shastras. All the Vedic histories sing the glories of this Vaishnava Dharma. Nyaya Ratna It is obvious that Chaitanya Dev is the pioneer of this doctrine, but he appeared less than 150 years ago, so how can it be eternal? Vaishnava Das This Vaishnava Dharma has been in existence from the very moment of the Jiva's appearance. The Jivas are anadi because they have no beginning in material time. Therefore, the constitutional function of the jivas, known as Jaiva Dharma or Vaishnava Dharma, is also an Adi. Brahma is the first jiva to take birth in the universe. As soon as he appeared, the Vedic sound vibration, which is the basis of Vaishnava Dharma, also became manifest. This is recorded in the four essential shlokas of Srimad Bhagavatam, 
2.9.33-36, known as the Chatu Shloki. It is also mentioned in the Mundaka Upanishad 1.1.1. Brahma Devanam Pratama Samba Bhuva Vishvasya Karta Bhuvanasya Kopta Sa Brahma Vidyam Sarva Vidya Pratishtam Atarva Yajesta Putraya Praha Brahma, who is the first of all the Devas, and who appeared from the lotus that sprouted from the navel of Bhagavan, is the creator of the universe and the maintainer of all living entities. He imparted Brahma Vidya, which is the basis for all other knowledge, unto his eldest son Atarva. The Rig Veda Samhita mentions the instructions of this Brahma Vidya, 122.20. Tad Vishno Paramam Padam Sada Pashyanti Suraya Diviva Chakshur Atatam The Suras, celestial beings, always behold the supreme abode of Bhagavan Sri Vishnu, just as the unobstructed eye sees the sun within the sky. It is said in the Kata Upanishad, 139, Tad Vishno Paramam Padam, Vishno Yart Paramam Padam. That supreme abode of Bhagavan Sri Vishnu is the highest attainment. The Shvetashvatara Upanishad 5.4 says, Sarva Disha Udrvam Adash Chatir Yak, Prakash Sayan Brajate Yadvanadvan, Evam Sadevo Bhagavan Varenyo, Yoni Svabhavan Adidistyate Ka. Bhagavan is the Supreme Person and the original source of all the Devas. He is the supreme object of worship and is one without a second. Just as the sun shines radiantly, illuminating all directions, upwards, downwards and on all sides, so Bhagavan regulates material nature, which is the origin of all different species of life. It is said in the Taittiriya Upanishad 2.1.2, Satyam Gyanam Anantam Brahma, Yoveda Nihitam Guhayam Parame Vyoman, So Snute Saravan Karman, Saha Brahmana Vipaschitaha. Paratattva Brahma is the embodiment of truth, knowledge, and eternity. Although that Para Brahma is situated in the spiritual sky, he is hidden in the sky of the hearts of all living entities. One who knows Ishwara, who is situated within as the indwelling supersoul, attains the consummation of all his desires in contact with that all-knowing Sri Hari. Nyayaratna The Rig Veda states, Tad Vishnu Paramam Padam. They see the supreme abode of Vishnu. How can you say that this doesn't refer to the Vaishnava Dharma that is included in the Mayavad doctrine? Vaishnava Das the Vaishnava Dharma, that is included within the scope of Mayavad, rejects the conception of eternal servitorship to Bhagavan. The Mayavadis believe that when the sadhak acquires knowledge, he attains a status of Brahman. However, where is the question of service if one becomes Brahman? It is said in the Kata Upanishad 1.2.23 Nayam Atma Pravachaneno Labyo Na Medhaya Na Bahuna Shrutena Yam eva shaivrinute te na labyas, tasyaisa atma vivrinute tanum svam. That paramatma parabrahma cannot be attained by theoretical explanations, by intelligence, or even by hearing the Vedas extensively. That paramatma is attainable only by one upon whom he bestows his mercy, being pleased with that person's attitude of unalloyed service. Only to such a person does Sri Hari reveal his own form. The only true religion is the constitutional function of service and surrender. There is no other means to attain Bhagavan's mercy and thus see his eternal form. Knowledge of Brahman will not enable one to attain darshan of Bhagavan's eternal form. We can understand from this categorical Vedic statement that pure Vaishnava Dharma is founded upon the Vedas. All the Vedas sanction the Vaishnava Dharma that Sriman Mahaprabhu taught. There is no room for doubt in this regard. Nyayaratna Is there any statement in the Vedas to the effect that Krishna Bhajan 
and not realization of Brahmagyan is the highest attainment? Vaishnavadas. It is said in the Taittiriya Upanishad 271, Raso Vai Saha. Sri Hari is the embodiment of Rasa. Besides, the Chandogya Upanishad 8.13.1 states, Shamach Chabalam Prapadye, Shabalach Chiamam Prapadye. By the worship of that Parabrahma of blackish complexion, one attains Sri Hari's divine abode, which is replete with varieties of transcendental paraphernalia and pastimes. And by reaching that variegated abode, one attains Shama Sundar, Sri Krishna. There are many similar statements in the Vedas which declare that Krishna Bhajan is the highest attainment. Nyaya Ratna Is the name Krishna anywhere to be found in the Vedas? Vaishnav Das Does the word Shyam not refer to Krishna? It is said in the Rig Veda, 122.164.31 Apashyam gopam anipadyama nama. I saw a cowherd boy who is imperishable. There are many statements in the Vedas that refer specifically to Krishna, who appeared as the son of a gopa, cowherd. Nyayaratna. Krishna's name is not clearly mentioned in any of these statements. This is simply your contrived interpretation. Vaishnav Das. If you study the Vedas carefully, you will see that they have used these types of indirect statements in relation to every topic. The sages of old have explained the meaning of all these statements and we should have the highest regard for their opinions. Nyayaratna Please tell me the history of Vaishnava Dharma. Vaishnava Das I have already said that the appearance of Vaishnava Dharma is concurrent with the origin of the jiva. Brahma was the first Vaishnava. Sriman Mahadev is also a Vaishnava, as are the progenitors of mankind. Sri Narad Goswami, who was born from the mind of Brahma, is a Vaishnava. This clearly verifies that Vaishnava Dharma is not a recent development, but has been prevalent from the very beginning of creation. Not all living entities are free from the influence of the three modes of nature and the superiority of a high Vaishnava will depend on the degree to which he is free from the modes. The Mahabharat, Ramayan, and the Puranas are the histories of the Aryan race, and they have all described the excellence of Vaishnava Dharma. We have already seen that Vaishnava Dharma was present at the beginning of creation. Prahlad and Dhruva were both pure Vaishnavas. During their time, there were many thousands of other Vaishnavas whose names are not given anywhere in history because only the most prominent have been mentioned. Dhruva was the grandson of Manu and Prahlad was the grandson of Prajapati Kashyapa and they both lived close to the beginning of creation. Of this there is no doubt. You can therefore observe that pure Vaishnava Dharma was active from the beginning of history. Later, the kings of the solar and lunar dynasties, as well as the great munis and rishis, were all intently devoted to Sri Vishnu. There is extensive mention of Vaishnava Dharma in the three previous ages known as Satya, Treta and Dwarpa. Even in the present age of Kali, Sri Ramanuja, Sri Madhvacharya and Sri Vishnu Swami in southern India and Sri Nimbaditya Swami in western India, initiated many thousands of disciples into pure Vaishnava Dharma. By their mercy, perhaps half the population of India crossed the ocean of Maya and attained shelter at the lotus feet of Bhagavan. Also, just consider how many downtrodden and degraded people Sri Sachinandan, who is the master of my heart and soul, delivered in this land of Bengal. Can you still not perceive the greatness of Vaishnava Dharma in spite of witnessing all this? Nyayaratna Yes, but on what basis do you call Prahlad and the others Vaishnavas? Vaishnava Das They can be known as Vaishnavas on the basis of Shastra. Prahlad's teachers, Sanda and Umarka, wanted to instruct him in Brahmagyan contaminated with the doctrine of Mayavad, 
but he rejected their teaching, realizing that Harinam is the essence of all education, and he constantly chanted the name of Bhagavan with great love and affection. Under such circumstances, there can be no doubt that Prahlad was a pure Vaishnava. The truth is that one cannot understand the underlying essence of the Shastras without impartial and minute investigation. Nyayaratna If, as you say, Vaishnava Dharma has been in perpetual existence, what new insight did Chaitanya Mahaprabhu reveal for which he should be given such special regard? Vaishnava Das Vaishnava Dharma is like a lotus flower which gradually comes into bloom when the time is ripe. First it appears as a bud and then it slowly begins to blossom. In its maturity it is fully blossomed and attracts all jivas by diffusing its sweet fragrance in every direction. At the beginning of creation, four aspects of knowledge were expressed to Brahma through the medium of the Chatushloki Bhagavatam. These were Bhagavat Gyan, transcendental knowledge of the Absolute, as Bhagavan, Maya Vigyan, analytical knowledge of Ishwara's external potency, Sadhan Bhakti, the means of attaining the goal, and Prem, which is the object of attainment. These four elements were manifested in the Jiva's hearts as the sprout of the lotus flower of Vaishnava Dharma. At the time of Prahlad, this sprout took shape as a bud, which gradually began to blossom in the period of Veda Vyas Muni, and developed into a flower at the time of Ramanuja, Madhva, and the other Sampradaya Acharyas. Upon the appearance of Sriman Mahaprabhu, the Vaishnava Dharma became the fully blossomed flower of Prem, and began to attract the hearts of all jivas by spreading its enchantingly sweet fragrance. The supremely confidential essence of Vaishnava Dharma is the awakening of Prem. Sriman Mahaprabhu created the good fortune for all jivas by distributing this Prem through the chanting of Sri Hari Nam. Sri Nam Sankirtan is a priceless possession worthy of the highest regard. Did anyone reveal this teaching prior to Mahaprabhu? Although this truth existed in the Shastras, there was no radiant example of it that could inspire the ordinary jivas to practice it in their own lives. Indeed, before Sriman Mahaprabhu, had anyone ever plundered the storehouse of Prem Ras and distributed it in this way, even to common men? Nyaya Ratna All right, but if Kirtan is so beneficial, why do learned pundits not hold it in high esteem? Vaishnav Das the meaning of the word Pandit has become perverted in the present age of Kali. Panda means enlightened knowledge of the Shastra, and the word Pandit really refers to one who has such knowledge. These days, however, people are known as Pandits if they show off their vain sophistry in the Nyaya Shastra or explain the meaning of the Shmiti Shastra in novel ways that appeal to people in general. How can such Pandits understand or explain the meaning of Dharma and the true purport of the Shastras. That can only be realized by impartial analysis of all the Shastras. So how can anyone obtain it through the intellectual wrangling of Nyaya? The truth is that in Kali Yuga, those who are known as Pandits are expert at deceiving themselves and others by arguing uselessly. Assemblies of such Pandits engaged in heated debates over inconsequential matters, but they never discussed knowledge of ultimate reality, knowledge of the jiva's relationship with the absolute truth, the supreme goal for the jivas, or the method for attaining that goal. One can only understand the real nature of Prem and Kirtan when he discerns the truth of these matters. Nyaya Ratna All right, I admit that there are no qualified pundits these days, but why don't high-class brahmanas accept your Vaishnava Dharma? Brahmanas are situated in the mode of goodness, and they are naturally inclined to the path of truthfulness and exalted religious principles. So why is it that almost all brahmanas are opposed to Vaishnava Dharma? Vaishnava Das 
You are asking the question, so I am compelled to answer, although Vaishnavas are naturally opposed to criticizing others. I will try to answer your last question if you will not feel pain and anger at heart and if you sincerely desire to know the truth. Nyayaratna Come what may, our study of the Shastra has imbued us with a fondness for tranquility, self-control and tolerance. There is no question of not being able to tolerate your words. Please speak openly and without hesitation, and I will certainly respect whatever is reasonable and good. Vaishnav Das Please consider that Ramanuja, Madhva, Vishnu Swami and Nimbaditya were all Brahmanas, and that they each had thousands of Brahmana disciples. In Bengal, our Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was a Vedic Brahmana. Our Nityananda Prabhu was a Radhiya Brahmana, and our Advaita Prabhu was a Varendra Brahmana. Our Goswamis and Mahajans were almost all Brahmanas. Thousands of Brahmanas, who are the very pinnacle of the Brahminical lineage, have taken refuge of Vaishnava Dharma and are propagating this spotless religion in the world. So how can you claim that high-class Brahmanas have no regard for Vaishnava Dharma? We know that those Brahmanas who honor Vaishnava Dharma are all high-class Brahmanas. However, some people who have taken birth in Brahmana families have become inimical towards Vaishnava Dharma because they are marred by the faults of degraded family lineage, undesirable association and false education. Such behavior only demonstrates their misfortune and fallen condition. This is no evidence that they are actually Brahmanas. It is to be especially noted that, according to Shastra, the number of true Brahmanas in Kali Yuga is exceedingly small, and these few are Vaishnavas. When a Brahmana receives the Vaishnava Gayatri Mantra, which is the mother of the Vedas, he becomes an initiated Vaishnava. However, due to the contamination of Kali Yuga, some of these Brahmanas accept another non-Vedic initiation, and abandon their Vaishnavism. Granted, the number of Vaishnav Brahmanas is very small, but that is still no reason to manufacture a conclusion that is opposed to the tenets of Shastra. Nyayaratna Why is it that so many low-class people accept Vaishnava Dharma? Vaishnav Das This should not be a cause for doubt. Most low-class people consider themselves quite wretched and downtrodden, and thus they are eligible for the mercy of Vaishnavas, without which one cannot become a Vaishnava. Humility cannot touch the heart of one who is intoxicated with the pride of high birth and wealth, and consequently it is very rare for such people to obtain the mercy of the Vaishnavas. Nyayaratna I don't care to discuss this subject any further. I can see that you will inevitably quote the harsh descriptions from the Shastra of the Brahmanas of Kali Yuga. I feel greatly pained when I hear particular statements from the Shastra, such as this one from the Varaha Purana. Rakshasa Kalimashritya Jayante Brahma Yonishu Taking refuge of the age of Kali, demons are born in the families of Brahmanas. Let us not pursue this topic any further. Now please tell me, why don't you respect Sri Sankaracharya, who is a limitless ocean of knowledge? Vaishnav Das Why do you say that? We consider Sri Sankaracharya to be an incarnation of Sri Mahadev. Sri Man Mahaprabhu instructed us to honor him by addressing him as Acharya. We only reject his Mayavad doctrine because it is a covered form of Buddhism, which the Vedas do not support. On Bhagavan's order, Sankaracharya distorted the meaning of the Vedas, Vedanta and the Gita, and he broadcast the false doctrine of impersonal monism known as Advaitavad to convert those men who had a demoniac nature. What fault is there in this for which Sankaracharya should be condemned? Buddha Dev is an avatar of Bhagavan, who also established and preached a doctrine that is opposed to the Vedas. But do descendants of the Aryans condemn him for this? Someone may disagree with such activities of Sri Bhagavan and Mahadev, 
and claim that they are unjust. But we say that Ishwara is the protector of the universe, and Sri Mahadev is his representative, and they are both all-knowing and all-auspicious. Ishwara and Mahadev cannot possibly be guilty of injustice. Those who blame them are ignorant and narrow-minded and cannot understand the deeper significance of their activities. Ishvara and his activities are beyond human reasoning, so intelligent people should never think, Ishvara should not have done that, it would have been better for him to do this. Ishvara is the director of all jivas, and only he knows the necessity for binding men of ungodly nature with the doctrine of illusion. We have no means of understanding Ishwara's purpose for manifesting the jivas at the time of creation and then destroying their forms at the time of the cosmic annihilation. This is all Sri Bhagavan's Leela. Those who are intently devoted to Sri Hari experience great delight in hearing his pastimes. They don't like to engage in intellectual debates about these matters. Nyayaratna That is all right. But why do you say that the Mayavad doctrine is opposed to the Vedas, Vedanta and the Gita? Vaishnavdas, if you have carefully examined the Upanishads and the Vedanta Sutra, kindly tell me which mantras and sutras support the doctrine of Mayavad. I will then explain the true meaning of these statements and prove that they do not support Mayavad at all. Some Vedic mantras may appear to contain a faint trace of Mayavad philosophy. But if one examines the mantras that come before and after, that interpretation will be instantly dispelled. Nyayaratna Brother, I have not studied the Upanishads and the Vedanta Sutra. When it comes to a discussion of the Nyaya Shastra, I am ready to discourse on any topic. Through logic, I can turn a clay pot into a piece of cloth, and a piece of cloth into a clay pot. I have read a little of the Gita, but I have not entered into it deeply, so I cannot say any more on this point. Instead, let me ask you one more question on another topic. You are a learned scholar, so please properly explain to me why Vaishnavas don't have faith in the remnants of food offered to the Devas and Devis, although they have great faith in Vishnu Prasad. Vaishnavdas, I am not a scholar, I am a great fool. You should know that whatever I am speaking is only by the mercy of my Gurudev, Paramahamsa Babaji Maharaj. No one can know all the Shastras, for they are a limitless ocean. But my Gurudev has churned that ocean and delivered the essence of the Shastras to me. I have accepted that very essence as the conclusion that all the Shastras have established. The answer to your question is that Vaishnavas do not disrespect the prasad of the Devas and Devis. Sri Krishna is the supreme controller of all controllers. Therefore he alone is known as Parameshwara. All the Devas and Devis are his devotees, and they are appointed to positions in the administration of universal affairs. Vaishnavas can never disrespect the prasad of bhaktas because one obtains Shuddha Bhakti by honoring their remnants. The dust from Bhakta's feet, the nectar-like water that has washed Bhakta's feet, and the nectar-like food that has touched Bhakta's lips are three types of prasad that are supremely beneficial. They are the medicine that destroys the disease of material existence. The fact is that when Mayavadis worship the Devatas and offer food to them, the Devatas do not accept it because the worshippers are contaminated with attachment to the doctrine of illusion. There is ample evidence of this in the Shastra, and if you ask me, I can supply the quotations. The worshippers of the Devas are mostly Mayavadis, and it is detrimental to one's Bhakti and an offence to Bhakti Devi to accept the prasad of the Devas when such people have offered it. If a pure Vaishnava offers the prasad of Krishna to the Devas and Devis, they accept it with great love and begin to dance. And if a Vaishnava then takes that prasad, he experiences tremendous happiness. Another point to consider is that the instruction of the Shastra is all-powerful, and the Yoga Shastras direct practitioners of the Yoga system not to accept the prasad of any Devata. This does not mean that those who practice Yoga disrespect the prasad of the Devatas, 
It simply means that giving up prasad helps those who are practicing yoga sadhana to obtain one-pointedness in meditation. Similarly, in bhakti sadhan, a bhakta cannot attain exclusive devotion to Sri Bhagavan, who is the object of his worship, if he accepts the prasad of any other deva. It is therefore a mistake to think that Vaishnavas are averse to the prasad of other devas and devis. The various practitioners only behave in that way to try to attain perfection in their respective goals, as the Shastras recommend. Nyayaratna. All right, that is clear. But why do you oppose the killing of animals in sacrifice when the Shastras support it? Vaishnav Das. It is not the intention of Shastra that animals should be killed. The Vedas declare, Mahim Syat Sarvani Bhutani. One should not commit violence to any living entity. This statement forbids violence to animals. As long as human nature is strongly influenced by the modes of passion and ignorance, people will be spontaneously driven to illicit connection with the opposite sex, meat-eating and intoxication. Such people do not ask the Vedas to sanction their activities. The purpose of the Vedas is not to promote such activities, but rather to curb them. When human beings are situated in the mode of goodness, they can naturally refrain from animal slaughter sexual indulgence and intoxication. Until that point, the Vedas prescribe various means to control such tendencies. For this reason, they sanction association with the opposite sex through vivaha yagya, marriage. The killing of animals in sacrifice and the drinking of wine in particular ceremonies. By practicing in this way, these tendencies will gradually wane in a person and he will eventually be able to give them up. This is the true purpose of the Vedas. They do not recommend the killing of animals. Their intention is expressed in these words of Srimad Bhagavatam 11.5.11 Loke vyavaya mishavmadya seva nityastu janturna hitatra chodana vyavastiti steshu vivaha yagya sura grahe ashu nivritir ishta it is observed that people in this world have a natural tendency towards intoxication, meat-eating and sexual enjoyment, but Shastra cannot sanction their engagement in such activities. Therefore, special provisions have been given whereby some association with the opposite sex is permitted through marriage, some eating of flesh is permitted through performance of sacrifice, and the drinking of wine is permitted through the ritual known as Sotramani Yagya. The purpose of such injunctions is to restrain the licentious tendencies of the general populace and to establish them in moral conduct. The intrinsic purpose of the Vedas in making such provisions is to draw people away from such activities altogether. The Vaishnava conclusion in this regard is that there is no objection if a person whose nature is ruled by passion and ignorance kills animals. However, a person who is situated in the mode of goodness should not do so, because causing harm to other jivas is an animalistic propensity. Sri Narad has explained this in Srimad Bhagavatam 1.13.47 Ahastani sahastanam apadani chatuspadam palguni tatramahatam jivo jivasya jivanam Living entities without hands are prey for those with hands. Life forms without legs are food for the four-legged. Small creatures are subsistence for larger ones. In this way, one living entity is the means of existence for another. The verdict of Manu Shmriti 5.56 is also very clear. Na mangsa bakshane doshe, na madye na chamaitune, pravritir eshabhutanam, nivritis tu mahapala. Abstinence from activities such as sexual indulgence, meat-eating and intoxication yields highly beneficial results, although a human being is naturally inclined to them. Nyayaratna Yes, but why do the Vaishnavas object to the Shraddha ceremony and other activities that are meant to repay one's debt to the forefathers? Vaishnav Das 
People who are intent on carrying out prescribed pious duties perform the Shraddha ceremony in accordance with the Karma Kanda division of the Vedas. Vaishnavas have no objection to this, but Shastra declares, Devarshi Bhutapta Nirnam Pitrinam Na Kinkaro Nayam Rinni Charajan Sarvatmana Ya Saranam Saranyam Gato Mukundam Parihritya Kartam Srimad Bhagavatam 11.5.41 O King, when a human being gives up the ego of independence of Bhagavan and takes full shelter of Sri Mukunda as the supreme refuge, he is released from his debts to the devas, the sages, the general living entities, family members, mankind, and to the forefathers. Such a devotee no longer remains subordinate to such personalities, nor is he bound to their service. Consequently, bhaktas who have taken shelter of Bhagavan are not required to perform the Shraddha ceremony and other karmakanda activities meant for gaining release from the debt to one's forefathers. They are instructed to worship Bhagavan, to offer Bhagavat Prasad to the forefathers and to honor Bhagavat Prasad with their friends and relatives. Nyayaratna At what point does one obtain the position and eligibility to act in this way? Vaishnav Das It is the prerogative of a Vaishnava to act in this way, and one becomes eligible from the time that one awakens faith in Harikatha and Harinam. It is said in the Srimad Bhagavatam 11.29 Tavat kamani kurvita na nir vidyeta yavata matkata shravanadova shradha yavan na jayate One is obliged to engage in karma and to follow the rules and prohibitions associated with that path as long as one has not awakened detachment from fruit of activities and the result of such activities such as promotion to the celestial planets, or as long as one has not awakened faith in hearing and chanting my Lila Gata. Nyayaratna I am delighted to hear your explanations. Seeing your scholarship and fine discrimination, my faith has now been awakened in Vaishnava Dharma. My brother Harihara, there is no profit in debating any further. These Vaishnavas are great teachers among pundits. They are exceedingly expert in extracting the conclusions of all the Shastras. We may say whatever we like to preserve our occupation, but it is highly doubtful whether anyone has ever appeared in the land of Bengal, or all of India for that matter, who can compare to such a renowned scholar and exalted Vaishnava as Nimai Pandit. Let us go. The day is waning, and it will be difficult to cross the Ganga after dark. Nyayaratna and his group of teachers departed, calling out, Hari Bol, Hari Bol. The Vaishnavas then began to dance and chant, Jai Sachinandan, Jai Sachinandan. Thus ends the tenth chapter of Jaivadharma entitled, Nitya Dharma and History.